Oh shit, don't tell me my niggas got lost in time. My niggas are dying before their time. My niggas are serving unjust time. My niggas are dying because of time. If you woke up this morning to a brighter day and feeling just a bit more rested than usual, your body is not playing tricks. This morning at 2 a.m., the clocks fell back an hour, marking the end of daylight saving time. How do people use that extra hour? Well, I, for one, use it to just feel better about my day. I feel like I have more time to get all the stuff I need to get done. We asked our colleagues and listeners how they plan to use that bonus hour, beginning with NPR White House reporter Asma Halit, who says the campaign grind never stops. When I first realized that daylight saving time was ending this weekend, I was ecstatic because I realized it means I get an extra hour of sleep, which at this moment I could very much use. I am tired of this crazy campaign cycle. Ah, we get an extra hour of it. I'm Ben Abrams, and I am a nocturnal slash semi-nocturnal producer on Morning Edition. And what I'm going to do for my extra hour this weekend is get as much sleep as I can because I'm pretty sleep deprived uh, during the week. The weekend is like the one time I can get enough sleep and not feel like a zombie. My name is Jung Yoon Han. I'm with the Washington Desk. On Saturday night, my roommates and I are hosting a party at our house. It's Halloween themed too, so we'll get to have an extra hour to dress up in our costumes. My name is Haley Miller and I'm a medical laboratory scientist in microbiology. I will be spending my extra hour continuing to provide patients with their lab results so that they can receive the care they need and hopefully they can go home and enjoy that extra hour of sleep. My name is Robert Scotch. I am a market setup and salesperson for Willow Wisp Organic Farm. Before the time change, I arrive in relative darkness. Post time change, there's almost full light for the setup, making for a much smoother process. And for those night hawks working in bars and clubs, daylight saving can make long nights even longer. My name's Lonnie Wynn, and I go by DJ Lonnie Love. I've been DJing for 17 years. I've DJed pretty much every daylight savings change. There was one night in particular that I DJed with my friend Bounce Castle, and the crowd was just so hype. And then when we told them they had an extra hour, it's like the room erupted. It was such a blast. Now, not everyone enjoys this time shift, like sleep scientist Karen Johnson. I will definitely be sleeping and <laughs> getting an extra hour of sleep, but otherwise I've been busy this weekend advocating for permanent standard time. Johnson is a neurologist and co-chair of the Coalition for Permanent Standard Time, and she says the disruption to our circadian rhythm can be harmful. I think the science is clear. Standard time best aligns our natural circadian rhythms with the sun, which is best for our overall health. Jamie Zeitzer, another sleep scientist, says daylight saving is a heated topic in the sleep science community. Many of my colleagues are very much against it. I'm not so against it. I don't think it's ideal, but I think that the impact that it has in terms of our health is quite small. Zeitzer will use that extra hour of sunlight to spend more time with family, although he's not typically a morning person. Uh, not by choice. <laughs> My kids are morning people. My wife's a morning person. I know I speak for everyone here at Weekend Edition when I say that extra hour of sleep is pretty nice. Standard time, we're glad to have you back. Amala supports taxpayer-funded sex changes for prisoners. Surgery. Um, for prisoners. For prisoners. Every transgender inmate in the prison system would have access. It's hard to believe, but it's true. Even the liberal media was shocked Kamala supports taxpayer-funded sex changes for prisoners and illegal aliens. Every transgender inmate would have access. Kamala's for they, them. President Trump is for you. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. If you've watched TV this month, especially sports like football or baseball, you've likely seen campaign ads supporting Donald Trump by attacking Kamala Harris over transgender issues. Laura Barone-Lopez looks at what's behind them. 
Less than 1% of the U.S. population identifies as transgender. But this election year, Republicans have spent a considerable amount of money on ads demonizing transgender people. From October 7th to the 20th, Trump's campaign and pro-Trump groups spent an estimated $95 million, and more than 41% of those ads were anti-trans. Kamala supports taxpayer-funded sex changes for prisoners. Surgery. Um, for prisoners. Uh, for prisoners. Every transgender inmate in the prison system would have access. Hell no, I don't want my taxpayer dollars going I, to that. Kamala supports transgender sex changes in jail with our money. Kamala even supports letting biological men compete against our girls in their sports. Kamala is for they, them. President Trump is for you. Erin Reed is an advocate and independent journalist covering LGBTQ issues, and she tracks transgender legislation around the world. Recently, Erin announced her decision to endorse Vice President Kamala Harris in this year's presidential election. Erin, thank you so much for being here. Thank you us. so much for having me on. Anti-trans rhetoric is a regular part of Donald Trump's stump speeches. He regularly lies about kids going to school and receiving gender-affirming surgeries before they return home. But now in the final stretch, Republicans have been putting out increasing amount of ads that are anti-trans, making it essentially their closing argument. Help us understand the scope and the rhetoric in these ads. I have tracked around $100 million in ads. We see Donald Trump spending more money on these ads than on housing, immigration, and the economy combined. This is a major issue for him. Meanwhile, you have groups like the Senate Leadership Fund dropping extreme amounts of money in Senate races in Ohio, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, and they're all focused on transgender people. The top issues, according to most polls right now, is the economy, abortion, immigration. So why do you think Trump and his allies are making this one of their main closing arguments? It's important to note that some of the biggest benefactors of the Republican Party, some of the most influential organizations in the party, we're talking groups like the Alliance Spending Freedom, for instance, have made this their main issue. If you're running a campaign in a place like Pennsylvania or Ohio or Michigan at any level and you want money in your campaign, targeting trans people is a really good way to do that. But as for Trump, I think that there's something different at play here. I think that this is a classic fear campaign. We've just got polling today showing that Harris is catching up on the economy and on other issues that Republicans tend to poll well in. And so the purpose of a fear campaign is to distract you from issues that you normally care about by making you so afraid of a group of people, of somebody like me, for instance, that you're willing to throw everything else away because you're scared. Who are these ads targeting? They run during major sporting events. They were just on during the World Series. Who is he trying to reach here? The group of people that are watching these sporting events are young men. And I think in a lot of cases, the Republican Party is trying to tap into what they hope is some level of fear that they can draw up from that group of people. If you look at most polling, and anecdotally, really, young people tend to understand trans people better than anybody else. They're not as afraid of us. And I think that might be part of why this messaging campaign might be falling short. These ads make pretty specific claims about surgery for transgender inmates and undocumented immigrants. Let's take a listen. Under liberal borders are Kamala Harris. Illegal aliens are pouring into our country, including murderers, rapists, and even terrorists. Instead of paying for their crimes and receiving justice, Kamala will give criminal illegal aliens taxpayer-funded transgender surgeries. Walk us through the facts about what's actually happened with those populations. What the ad is actually talking about is medical care in the United States is a right. By the Eighth Amendment, you cannot deny medical care to prisoners. And under the law, a law that was in place during the Trump administration, if a doctor determines that an inmate needs medical care, then they get it. So these ads are actually focused on two instances where a transgender person received gender-affirming care in prison, a surgery. And the amount of money spent on these particular cases is far less than the amount of advertising dollars that Trump is pouring into this issue. About two to four hundred times more money is being used in political ads to make you afraid of two transgender inmates, so afraid that you're not going to care about the economy anymore. You're not going to care about abortion anymore.
Aaron, when you take a step back, what are the stakes in this election for transgender Americans? It's been an especially difficult year in the last two or three years for trans people. Just two days ago in Odessa, Texas, they passed a $10,000 bounty on trans people found in the bathroom. I've been tracking anti-LGBTQ legislation for years now, and it's not just the ads. The legislatures themselves are spending more time on this issue than anything else. This has been priority number one. And the trans people that live in these states, they constantly have to hear their humanity debated in public. They constantly have to worry about things that I think a lot of Americans take for granted. Things like going to the bathroom, getting an updated driver's license, playing a school sport with your friends. But trans people right now are under a relentless assault by the Republican Party. These bills are passing in primarily Republican states. Even if Trump doesn't win and we get a Kamala Harris presidency, we have to contend with a nation that has been primed to hate people like me. Aaron Reid, thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Everybody's always in a hurry these days. If they're not rushing somewhere, they'll be changing something that doesn't need changing. That's why I'm glad we're standing behind the president. Sure we are. It just makes good sense. You don't want to change horses in midstream. Why are they sticking with this age-old horse shit? Why are they sticking with the same old garbage? Who hires these people? I mean, I feel insulted just having seen it. You know well, what I mean? It's offensive. Bad. Poorly costume. W would you vote for that person based on that commercial? You know I don't vote. Why don't you vote? Last time I voted, voted that one time, Major League Baseball, when they started the fans voting thing, and I voted for Boo Powell for first base. He didn't get in, and it, it just disappointed me. It stayed with me. I just, it's futile. That was it. You never voted for president? No. Well, do you vote? No. no. I always vote for the Academy Awards, but I never win. Liz, do you vote? Mm? Do you vote? No, I don't vote, no. I don't like the rooms. Too claustrophobic. I can't vote in small places. The 2024 presidential campaign is officially over after some 11th hour appeals in key battleground states. Late last night, former President Donald Trump held his final rally in Grand Rapids, Michigan. This has been an incredible journey. It's very sad in a way because, you know, we've done all these and this is the last one. But here's the good news. All we were doing is putting ourselves in a position to win, which we can do tomorrow very easily if we show up. And Vice President Kamala Harris wrapped up her campaign in Philadelphia. So America comes down to this. One more day, just one more day in the most consequential election of our lifetime, and the momentum is on our side. We are in the final hours of the election. The two candidates appear to be deadlocked. So now, as the last ballots are cast, we wait and reflect. Because it can be hard to remember from where we sit today that when this presidential campaign began, it looked a lot like the last one. Everything sounded familiar, down to the candidates. In order to make America great and glorious again, I am tonight announcing my candidacy for President of the United States. That's why I'm running for re-election. Because I know America. I know we're good and decent people. Former President Donald Trump and sitting President Joe Biden became the presumptive nominees for their parties in March. This year was set to be the first U.S. presidential rematch since 1956. And everyone thought, OK, we all know sequels are rarely more interesting than the original. In fact, it seemed like this election might be downright boring. Well, the joke was on us, because while we can't say what the outcome of this election will be, we can say that Americans have just lived through the most dramatic, eventful, unexpected presidential campaign of our lives. More Democrats uh, seem to be getting cold feet over President Biden's re-election campaign. Okay, we are watching live at a rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, where former President Trump was speaking on the stage. A shooting at former President Trump's campaign rally is being investigated as an attempted assassination. President Joe Biden has just announced that he is dropping out of the 2024 presidential race. A a second apparent attempt on former President Trump's life, this time the incident... The 2024 presidential campaign went from deja vu to utter chaos in a matter of months. So today we're revisiting the key moments that brought us to this point in the race. Let's start with the evening of June 27th, 2024. 
We're live from Georgia, a key battleground state in the race for the White House. The debate between President Biden and former President Trump in Atlanta. This was unusually early in the calendar for a presidential debate, and that timing would turn out to be crucial because Biden's performance sent Democrats into a tailspin. Uh, eligible for what I've been able to do with the, uh, with, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with, uh, look, if... We finally beat Medicare. Members of the Democratic Party began calling for Biden to drop out. But the president was resolute. Here's what he told ABC's George Stephanopoulos the week after the debate. If you can be convinced that you cannot defeat Donald Trump, will you stand down? With the friends of and with the Lord Almighty comes out and tells me that, I might too bad. Biden sent a letter to congressional Democrats saying, quote, I am firmly committed to staying in this race. But former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi didn't seem to get the message. She said this on MSNBC's Morning Joe. It's up to the president to decide if he is going to run. Uh, we're all encouraging him uh, to, to make that decision uh, because time is running short. And just like that, she reignited the debate over Biden's future. Then, while Democrats were wringing their hands, a major event rocked the Trump campaign. And we'll warn you, you're about to hear gunshots. Take a look at what happened. <laughs> On July 13th, a man outside of a Trump rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, shot the former president, grazing his ear. One person died and two were critically wounded. The next morning, Trump posted on social media, quote, We will fear not, but instead remain resilient in our faith and defiant in the face of wickedness. We have breaking news here. Former President Donald Trump just announced that J.D. Vance... Two days after the attempt on his life, Trump chose his running mate, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance. It was the start of the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee. And that night, Vance told Fox News about getting the call from Trump. You know, he, he just said, look, uh, I think we're going to go save this country. Uh, I think you're the guy who can help me in the, in, in the best way. You can help me govern. You can help me win. Republicans kicked off their convention feeling like they were on a roll. The event almost had a religious fervor, with people wearing bandages over their ears in solidarity with Trump. In his July 19th speech accepting the Republican nomination for president, Trump referenced that assassination attempt. I'm not supposed to be here tonight. Not supposed to be here. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Thank you. But I'm not. And I'll tell you, I stand before you in this arena only by the grace of Almighty God. And while Republicans were celebrating in Milwaukee, Biden was sidelined with COVID. Finally, on July 21st, the president posted on social media that he was ending his campaign. President Joe Biden has just announced that he is dropping out of the 2024. He president. offered his, quote, full support and endorsement for Vice President Kamala Harris to be the party's nominee, cementing the decision in a formal address two days later. So I've decided the best way forward is to pass the torch to a new generation. That's the best way to unite our nation. Harris would have the shortest runway of any presidential campaign in modern history. She'd need to introduce herself to voters, explain a policy agenda, draw a contrast with Trump, and also choose a running mate. On August 6th in Philadelphia, she announced her pick. So Pennsylvania, I'm here today because I found such a leader. The Democratic convention in Chicago came with a rush of adrenaline as the party celebrated the first woman of color to lead the Democratic ticket. On behalf of everyone whose story could only be written in the greatest nation on earth, I accept your nomination to be president of the United States of America. The first and only debate between the two presidential candidates came on September 10th in New York City. They debated policy positions, including on the economy. The polls say 80 and 85 and even 90 percent that the Trump economy was great, that their economy was terrible. 
Donald Trump has no plan for you. And when you look at his economic plan, it's all about tax breaks for the richest people. I am offering what I describe as an opportunity economy. Trump also pushed a false claim about Haitian immigrants in Springfield, Ohio. The people that came in, they're eating the cats. They're eating, they're eating the pets of the people that live there. That led to weeks of threats and violence against the community in Springfield. Five days later, Trump was golfing when his life came under threat once again. Secret Service agents spotted a gunman lurking at the Trump International Golf Club in West Palm Beach, Florida. He didn't fire, and Trump wasn't harmed. A few days ago, we had an incident. I have to say, Secret Service did a hell of a job. They really did. They caught. And that brings us to the last week before Election Day, as Harris and Trump made their final appeals to the American people. On October 27th, former President Trump gave his closing argument at Madison Square Garden in New York City. It was a homecoming rally of sorts, where he and his opening acts leaned into divisive rhetoric. On day one, I will launch the largest deportation program in American history. We will get critical race theory and transgender insanity the hell out of our school. And two days later, Vice President Harris made her closing argument at the Ellipse in Washington, D.C., the same place where Donald Trump encouraged a crowd to march on the Capitol on January 6, 2021. Harris went through key parts of her platform, from grocery prices to reproductive rights, and drew a stark contrast with Trump. On day one, if elected, Donald Trump would walk into that office with an enemies list. When elected, I will walk in with a to-do list full of priorities of what I will get done for the American people. And now, after four turbulent months, the final polls going into Election Day show a closer race than the U.S. has seen in years. The two candidates appear to be in a dead heat, a tie, which means as we reach the finish line, this dramatic and unpredictable presidential race is living up to its reputation even down to the very last stretch. Okay, Donald Trump. <laughs> I say meet your next president. <laughs> In the end, it wasn't close at all. Donald Trump has staged one of the biggest political comebacks in U.S. history. He not only won in the Electoral College, but also looks like winning the popular vote. His Republican Party also has control of the Senate, and it's on course to win the House. With Trump-appointed judges dominating the Supreme Court, it gives the incoming president a very powerful mandate for change and the ability to implement it. Here was Mr. Trump addressing supporters at his campaign headquarters in Florida. This will truly be the golden age of America. That's what we have to have. This is a magnificent victory for the American people. We've been through so much together, and today you showed up in record numbers to deliver a victory like no other. This was something special, and we're going we're gonna to pay you back. We're going to do the best job. We're going to turn it around. It's got to be turned around. It's got to be turned around fast, and this will forever be remembered as the day the American people regained control of their country. It's time to put the divisions of the past four years behind us. It's time to unite. And we're going to try, we're going to try, we have to try, and it's going to happen. Success will bring us together. America's future will be bigger, better, bolder, richer, safer, and stronger than it has ever been before. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Trump's win is bigger than when he was last elected president. All the more notable given that since then he's become a convicted felon, faced numerous lawsuits, survived two impeachments, and has been accused of supporting the January 6th riots. Many of those who worked in the first Trump administration have spoken out against him. His longest serving chief of staff, General John Kelly, described him as a fascist. And his former defense secretary, Mark Esper, said, I'm not sure we can survive another four years of Donald Trump. But his supporters were jubilant. Great. Trump won. Awesome. <laughs> Did you 
country really needed Trump to win because it was going in a very wrong direction. The world's obviously a super unstable place right now. Everything happening in the Middle East, the stuff in Eastern Europe. So I think that he has a lot of really solid plans in place. And I think the thing that's most helpful about him is the relationships that he maintains with these foreign leaders. Yes, I voted for Trump and I feel good with the numbers. I've got my fingers crossed. So, joy for Donald Trump and his base, but for Kamala Harris voters, it was a chastening night. Earlier in the evening, as results trickled in, showing a Republican surge, Ms. Harris cancelled her speech to the party faithful. Dejected Democrats streamed away early from the Harris headquarters at Howard University in Washington, D.C. So, a split country and a fractured America. And for the losing side, the mood is gloomy. Giovanni Chavez is president of the California Young Democrats. This is not normal. This is not normal at all. I remember days when a political gaffe could end someone's career. The outlier here is Donald Trump himself. Donald Trump is someone that's very, very divisive, someone that implemented a Muslim ban the last time he was in office, wanted to ban transgender folks from the military, had his supporters storm the Capitol. I think the only way we move on past this divisiveness and get back to a place where we can have friendly disagreements is when we move beyond Trump. And clearly we haven't done that now, but in four years, I think we'll be in a much better place. The BBC's Anna Foster was following every twist and turn of election night. She gave us her assessment. In the run-up to this event, we talked about the polls, didn't we, and the fact that it was neck and neck. And all through voting yesterday, everybody firmly believed that anything could happen. You know, we watched people casting their votes. We heard all of the sort of the rhetoric that was coming from the candidates. Because remember how much effort and energy both of them poured into the state of Pennsylvania. You know, when I was in Philadelphia and Kamala Harris had her final rally there, there was a sense of optimism among both sets of supporters. And I think when Pennsylvania was called for Donald Trump in the very early hours of the morning here. That really felt like the moment that things shifted and changed. His supporters absolutely jubilant today, particularly in those key swing states. They feel that they worked incredibly hard. They feel that the message that they were getting out, particularly on the economy, was going to resonate. And it, it's been proved now that it did. There was you know, a genuine belief among both camps that it was actually closer than the results that we're seeing so far actually bear out. I think they really thought, and particularly Kamala Harris's team, you know, they had a real sense of positivity. They felt that they were moving the dial, and we saw that, didn't we, sort of slip away as the night went on when she cancelled her planned appearance at the rally, when she said that she wouldn't be coming out and speaking today. And, you know, we saw the mood and the tone in those two camps. But I think what is really interesting as well is how people will react to this, again, in those key swing states. When we got the exit poll data, which looks very much at trends, at how people feel, not necessarily just who they voted for, we actually saw from both sides that this real sense of fear and nervousness about what would happen if the other side win. And I think you saw it in that speech that Donald Trump made where he talked about healing the country. I think there's this real schism, this fear that politics once again has opened up a huge divide across America and something now needs to be done to pull people back together, particularly as they wake up to this result. Anna Foster. The U.S. dollar surged as Donald Trump's victory became clear. Traders apparently bet on potential tax cuts, tariffs and rising inflation under Donald Trump. And the cryptocurrency Bitcoin is also at a record high. Europe's main stock markets rallied at the start of trading. London, Paris and Frankfurt all rose by about 1% while the dollar has gone up against the pound and the euro. The BBC's economics editor, Faisal Islam, says that the unexpectedly quick result had come as a relief to many. I think it's the absence of what they predicted in a way, which was that this uncertainty would go on for some time to come. And it's all been settled far more quickly than most of the popular wisdom had it, you know, that we'd be going through days of uncertainty and recounted votes and legal challenges and the like. That's all been settled far more quickly than expected. There's also the prospect of unified government. I'm not sure about that in terms of what happens in the House of Representatives, but you certainly have a clear direction with some of the absence, if you like, of likely or possible social unrest that was feared. But now there's lots of focus perhaps on what was less focused upon, which is exactly what a President Trump in his second term will do, not just as regards the US economy, which was clearly a fundamental factor in his second election, but also in the knock-on impact of some of these policies on global economics, which 
I would submit to you, will be profound and have capital cities all around the world kind of running to work out what the consequences will be, not just intended, but unintended too, about having the world's biggest economy go down a rather different economic path. Bipartisan analysts of the US deficits looked at both candidates' plans and said that both would increase borrowing by some amount. And this is against the context of a significant increase in US borrowing already and relatively large deficits going on for decades. On top of that now, the new American president, President-elect Trump, is predicted to add $8 trillion to the US debt with his sort of slew of mainly corporate tax cuts. So that has affected US borrowing rates. We've seen those go up. When they go up, they kind of affect everybody. They affect the UK, for example, significantly. Uh, will there be some sort of Federal Reserve response to that in terms of interest rates, which also affect the whole world? Now, the contrary argument here is something, again, that was not particularly well defined, but he, maybe we should take much more seriously than seemed at the time, which was that President Trump will get the likes of Elon Musk in for a Department of Government Efficiency and somehow cut two trillion out of US bureaucracy, because that's what he's promised. And if that happens, that will be quite something. Faisal Islam. White supremacy is the sickness. For many Americans, pandemic restrictions are a distant memory. But for some, those mandates affected them in ways that have hardened their faith and their politics. NPR's domestic extremism re correspondent Odette Youssef has this report on Americans still reeling more than three years since most states lifted restrictions. And here we are today. The Army of God! On a recent Saturday morning in front of the Lincoln Memorial in D.C., hundreds of Christians were outside and amped up. They waved flags, among them a white one with a green pine tree on it, the words, Appeal to Heaven, across the top. It's come to be a symbol of Christian nationalism, and some carried it on January 6th, when rioters stormed the U.S. Capitol. But like King David today, we are ushering in the presence of God to the capital city. The man behind this gathering is Sean Foyt. He's an evangelical worship leader, musician, and Trump loyalist. At the start of 2020, Foyt was not a well-known name, but COVID-19 changed that. That year, Foyt began breaking his state's COVID restrictions on religious gatherings with outdoor worship concerts, first in California, but then nationwide. Matthew Taylor met me at Foyt's recent event in D.C. He's with the Institute for Islamic, Christian, and Jewish Studies. He says today, Foyt is a millionaire and a celebrity that Christian lawmakers angle to stand with in photographs, and that Foyt's ascent all rested on his timely use of a long-standing narrative of grievance among some evangelical Christians. There had been decades of distrust sown, especially into conservative Christian communities, narratives of Christian persecution that then many leaders like Sean Foyt were able to activate in the midst of the COVID crisis. Now, COVID restrictions are over. Foyt and other Christian nationalist leaders have enjoyed the kind of access to Trump and other high office holders that was unimaginable a decade ago. And so the messaging has evolved from defending against a so-called tyrannical state to taking it over. So I want you to just start doing this with me. Come on, right here. Step by step, step by step, step by step, we're taking ground. The messaging over time became more and more nationalistic, more and more about, as, as Foyt would say, conquering spiritual territory. And Taylor says his research into January 6th has demonstrated the danger of this language of spiritual warfare. He says he's found that some people who were part of Foyt's COVID-19 worship protests also participated in the Capitol riot. So while I would not say that this is an extreme event in its presentation. There is extremism lurking around the edges of it. The pandemic also ushered militant Christian nationalist messaging into other strains of Christianity. Sarah Riccardi Swartz of Northeastern University studies Orthodox Christian communities. She says some of those churches defied state rules and stayed open during the pandemic. This brought in 
an unprecedented swell of American converts, including some who believe in spiritual warfare. Often these folks were already right wing or conservative, and they just became more radicalized throughout the pandemic. Riccardi, Swartz, and Taylor say the full effect of the pandemic on Christian communities in the U.S. is still not well understood. But for a small minority of American Christians, it has shifted them from claims of persecution to ambitions of taking over politics and culture. Odette Youssef, NPR News. You know, um, Robin Kelly says that we're going to need a surrealist moment. There's going to have to be something that breaks the continuum. Because until white women start giving birth to black babies, I think we are going to stay living in these incommensurable experiences. In Georgia, jubilation. It was the economy and immigration, not abortion, that defined this election. So, but how are you doing today? I just feel like I'm in a fever dream. Like this, I feel exactly how I did in 2016. In Atlanta, Democrats are crestfallen. Are you surprised she didn't do better with female voters? The disparity between, for the results, is shocking for sure. I think that's the most shocking part of it. Just how much more we needed um, to have gotten her elected. Kamala Harris took a risk putting reproductive rights at the top of her agenda. It didn't deliver. Yes, there were some wins, restrictive abortion bans undone in seven states, but activists feel abandoned. I feel let down, honestly, by um, first and foremost, white women voters in this country. White women in this particular election in 2024, at, at least in the presidential realm, voted at almost the exact same rate that they voted for the same person who is a convicted felon and the very person who is proudly telling you that he snatched away your reproductive rights. In so many rural and suburban areas, though, it was other anxieties that dominated. Why couldn't Democrats win over women like you? Um, I don't think she ever talked about anything that were the points that meant the most to me. The economy, the immigration, the, the crime that came with the immigration. Are you ready for a female president? A woman who served at a high rank in the military might very well make a good president. But a woman who's been a prosecutor in a very left state, I don't think so. The gender gap did play out in the election results. Women did favor Kamala Harris, but not nearly enough to cement her victory. She needed an earthquake. She got a rumble, one arguably eclipsed by the noisy sound of young men. Tradition still runs deep in America. A woman of color will not taste life at the helm this time. A crossroads, once again, passed over. Cordelia Lynch, Sky News, Georgia. When you don't vote, you can't sit on a jury. You have no right to complain about the police because you won't even go and vote so you can even sit on a jury. Uh, as I've told, uh, said to the cows when I first started to call in, I spent 11 years on a job where, where I worked for a bank and had to sit in court day after day after day after day. And I watched them select juries. I watched black people going to jail. Black people have white, having white probation officers. And the whole judicial system um, just truncated with white supremacy. And a great deal of it is could have been, some of it could be lessened if black people simply voted. So the results are in. It's now time for a post-mortem. The polls promised us a tight contest, but this is anything but. So what did result day tell us about the public sentiment? Let's dive into the voting data. The biggest issue this time was the economy. No two ways about it. For 39% of the voters, it was the number one concern. Whether it's sluggish jobs or recession fears or the cost of living crisis, that's the top issue. At number two was immigration. 
the mess that's been created at the southern border. 20% voters called it their most important issue. So that's 59% for economy and border, two issues that are considered to be Trump's strength. And what about abortion? It was number three at 11%. So the big picture is clear. 59% voters gave priority to Trump's biggest campaign points. Only 11% gave priority to Harris's biggest promise, which brings us to voting blocks. We heard a lot of theories heading into election day that women would flock to Harris, that Latinos would abandon Trump. Did any of that, did any of that actually happen? The simple answer is no. Around 54% women voted for Kamala Harris, 44% voted for Trump. So yes, Harris got more women votes, but Trump's share is actually 2% up from 2020. So he's added more women voters to his coalition. Now Harris's pitch was simple. Only she can protect abortion rights in America, but clearly that did not resonate. Maybe women are not single issue voters. They care about things beyond abortion too. Secondly, black and Latino voters. Again, a so-called weakness for Trump. Trump won 45% of Hispanic voters this time. Harris won 53%. So yes, she leads. But Trump's share has increased. And listen to this. It has, it has increased by 13% compared to 2020. So once again, he's added to his coalition. Among black voters, he stands at 12%, which is unchanged from the last election. Among black men, he's up 1% from the last time. He's up. So to recap, more women and Latinos voted for Trump this time. But guess who did not? Believe it or not, white voters. Trump is down 3% among white voters compared to last year. Now remember, these are all exit polls. The official results do not calculate race or gender. But it does tell a story. The narrative was that Trump alienated voters of color. A lot of focus was, uh, was on his rally in New York. One of his supporters called Puerto Rico floating garbage. But none of that has hurt his support base. Clearly, this was a vote cutting through race and gender, a vote on the state of the economy, the state of the, bo the border, basically a vote against the current status quo in America. And credit to Trump, because his team read the sentiment well. The Democrats talked about joy, about democracy being in danger, about Trump's denial of the 2020 results, but they were completely off. Those were not the key issues this time. The key issues were economy and the border. Trump kept hammering down on these issues even on election eve, and you can see the result. Plus, some of the Democratic talking points simply did not strike a chord. For example, transgender rights. Perhaps the push was well-intentioned, but this wasn't the election to do it. Exit polls found 50% of the voters said that trans rights had gone too far. Remember those Trump rants about men competing in women's sports? Well, they seem to have resonated. Same with the fake news about migrants eating dogs and cats. Harris mocked Trump for saying all of that. But the electorate was deeply concerned about the border. So the biggest takeaway from this election is this. The Democrats completely misread it, whether it was the anger against the economy, the anger against Joe Biden, or the perception about Kamala Harris. She wasn't seen as distinct from Biden. She was very much seen as part of the problem. In 2016, the Democrats underestimated Donald Trump and they paid the price for it. This time, they did not repeat that mistake, but they did underestimate the voter. In any election, anywhere in the world, that's a losing strategy. The FBI is investigating reports of a wave of racist text messages hitting people, black people's phones in multiple states. These messages are being reported in at least eight states, and many of the targets appear to be middle school, high school, and college age students. All of the messages following a pattern sharing similar language, including racist rhetoric, that they had been, quote, selected to pick cotton. CNN's Gabe Cohen has the details. He's joining us right now. Tell us more of what you're learning about what they're doing about this, Gabe. Well, okay, Kate, first off, it looks like this is more widespread than we had expected, with people in at least two dozen states now having reported receiving these messages. And these texts are not just upsetting, but they are alarming. They are personalized, and many of them specifically target 
black and brown individuals, some of them students, some of them children. I want to show you one of the texts. It was sent to us by a woman in New Jersey. Uh, the text has her name written at the top of it, as you can see right there, and it references picking cotton, it references slave catchers and plantations, and some of the messages specifically reference President-elect Trump. Now, to be clear, the Trump campaign has told several media outlets that they had absolutely nothing to do with this. But as you can imagine, many people are really on edge in these days since the election. Uh, I want to play for you what a Colorado mother said uh, after her 16-year-old son got one of these texts. Take a listen. It's very tense. It's very scary for a lot of individuals. The fact that it happened the day after, you know, Election Day, it really speaks to what I think is going on here. And the president of the NAACP put out a statement saying these messages represent an alarming increase in vile and abhorrent rhetoric from racist groups across the country who now feel emboldened to spread hate and stoke the flames of fear that many of us are feeling after Tuesday's election results. And, and Sarah, there are investigations underway all over the country at this point to figure out who is behind this. It does appear at least some of them, these messages, were sent out using a service called Text Now. It allows people to uh, create phone numbers for free. That company, Text Now, tells us in a statement, uh, we believe this is a widespread coordinated attack and we are now working alongside our industry partners to uncover more details and continue to monitor patterns to actively block any new accounts attempting to send these messages. And the FBI is also on this. They put out a statement saying that they're aware of the messages. And Sarah, they say they are in contact with the Justice Department and other federal authorities. So a lot of folks are on this right now, a lot of agencies. It's not clear, though, if they have it completely shut down at this point. Gabe Cohen, thank you so much for your reporting there. I appreciate it. The FBI is investigating a string of racist messages sent to black Americans across the U.S. This is one of the disturbing texts, and I'm sorry we have to put this up on screens. Uh, it says, it reads, uh, you have been selected to pick cotton at the nearest plantation. Again, uh, for the folks listening on the radio, I am reading quotes from this text and references executive slave catchers. Children and college students got messages like this. One mother in Houston said her daughter, who was in high school, uh, received one as well. Uh, let's listen to this. She said it's a message that she, her and some of her friends received. Um, and so I'm like, which friends? <laughs> and so she said, all of my black friends. To have somebody threaten their lives or threaten their livelihood or threaten their family's livelihood, um, it's, it becomes uncomfortable. This should not be sent to any student, black, brown, blue, purple, yellow, whatever. A Canadian phone services company tells CNN that some of the racist messages were sent by accounts on their messaging app. Uh, the company says it has disabled those accounts. And to be clear, CNN does not have a clear answer of who sent these. That is still under investigation. But uh, Talia Jones uh, joins us now. She received this text uh, we showed earlier. Uh, Talia, I mean, as we were just explaining a few moments ago, people in states uh, across uh, the eastern half of the United States, it appears, received these text messages. You got one as well. Um, and some out west, you can see it there on screen. What was your reaction when you got this message on your phone? My first reaction was kind of like shock because you know when you see something, you're like, let me look again to make sure like I'm really yeah. seeing what I'm seeing. That's the kind of feeling I had, and then I immediately sent it to my mom and my sister in our group chat, and we were all just like, what is going on in the world? There's no way that it's 2024 and things like this are are happening again and it's just insane like the level of disrespect that people have for other humans it's, it's crazy and, and i'm just wondering Talia. i mean what what did it feel like i i, I had to think uh, that it hurt i mean i have to think that it hurt when you got that message what was going through your mind how did it feel so first it was shock and then i think it was more anger than like sadness because it's just like who do you think you are to send these out it was really it became sadness when I, I realized that young people were getting it like elementary schoolers and middle schoolers who a lot of them are oblivious to what's going on it's like they're so innocent and it's like why would you want to intentionally hurt somebody that you don't even know so it was definitely like shock anger and sadness all in one 
Yeah, what do you think about the timing of all this? The uh, president and CEO of the NAACP released a statement saying, in part, the unfortunate reality of electing a president who historically has embraced and at times encouraged hate is unfolding before our eyes. I mean, we had an election this week. What do you think of the timing of this? It was definitely strategically planned. I received the text at like 2 p.m. on Wednesday, so not even a full 24 hours after we got the election results. So I feel like this was something that was definitely premeditated. They felt like they were going, the Republicans were going to win. Donald Trump was going to be elected into office again. So they were just ready to go. And it just really shows, like, we thought we came far from where we were hundreds of years ago. But honestly, we have not at all, clearly. And do you know anybody else who got this message? Not personally. Um, when I got on social media later that day, I saw that a lot of different people had gotten them. But nobody that I knew personally, but I did see that everybody who received the text was a person of color, for sure. Mm. And, and what do you hope people take away uh, from this? Uh, I mean, I, to me, it, it, I, I, I'm incredibly sad hearing about it. I know you were, you were angry, but I'm just incredibly uh, sad hearing about this. But what, what, do you, what do you want people to think about this weekend uh, after getting this kind of a text? For the people that voted the way that they voted, I want them to recognize this is the person that you voted for. This is the type of people that back him. And it's it's insane because at the end of the day, we're all humans. And I hope people take that. It's like we all bleed the same blood. Like there's nothing different between me and you, between a black person, a white person, a Spanish person. It doesn't matter. And I just feel like people need to really take into account that at the end of the day, we're all humans. And what you do directly affects other people, and there will be consequences to those actions. You're absolutely right about that. That 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 is a great message. Uh, it, it means a lot to me that you said it and you shared this story with us. Uh, apparently, we're just hearing now in the last couple of minutes today that it's now up to 21 states, 21 states where people receive these text messages. It's just awful. And it's, it's crazy because you would think that. I don't know. I would think that immediately people would find out where it's coming from and shut it down. So the fact that it's still happening today, which is Friday, 48 hours later, is just crazy. Yeah. Well, it says everything about the person who sent this text, not the people who received it. Uh, Talia Jones, thank you very much uh, for talking to us. We appreciate it. Thank you. This question, why is this stuff happening? The New York Times article, I mean, editorial today. The Trump effect. See, this is what I'm doing with my money, buying newspapers like Dick Gregory. <laughs> <laughs> the Trump effect and how it spreads. It says we are on the brink under, tr under Trump on the brink of fascism. New York Times, all the news that's fit to print, editorial 1210-2015. I say fascism is in stage white supremacy. See, it's, I mean, just like in Nazi Germany. Fascism, system of racism, white supremacy, determined to survive. A brazen plan to attack part of Nashville's power grid stopped just in time. Over the entire summer, the, 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 uh, the concern is just growing. He's he coming up with other ways to, to wreak havoc from blowing up power plants to derailing a train. Acting U.S. Attorney Thomas Jaworski says agents honed in on Skylar Philippi after he spoke about carrying out a mass shooting at a YMCA near Columbia. Saturday, he was caught with a drone and explosives just outside the gates of a Nashville substation, thanks to undercover agents who gained his trust. Mr. Philippi was interested in taking down up to nine power grids, and he thought that would just sow complete chaos and destroy our system, and then we would have to start over, and at that point they could implement their ideology. For months, the FBI had been tracking the 24-year-old and his extreme ideas tied to a white supremacist group. 
They say he researched previous attacks, including in North Carolina, where assailants shot at a substation to knock tens of thousands of people off the grid. The Justice Department says Philippi targeted Nashville because it is a financial and technological hub. It is terrifying, and part of his interest in Nashville, uh, he said he was 100 percent committed to hitting Nashville. I'm quoting him. And, and that's scary because he wants to hit high economic impact cities. He said he wants to hit high tax cities, uh, really things that you, where you can harm an economy. Philippi, who also has ties to Buffalo and Louisville, had just started a job with Ryder in Spring Hill. The U.S. attorney says this doesn't appear to be connected to the election, rather a desire to make a mark, no matter the cost. The agents offered him the opportunity to back out just before they went to the site. And to quote him, I'm fully committed to this. I want to do something big and go down in the annals of history. In Nashville, Hannah McDonald, News Channel 5. The Turner Diaries sold over half a million copies. Who do you think is buying it? Eric Rudolph, the Olympic bomber. Way Page, who shut up the Sea Temple. Larry Ford, developing typhoid and cholera. William Carr with the cyanide bomb. Anthrax, ricin, botulism, C4, IEDs. I could go on like this for hours, and all of them are white supremacists. is rushed to the hospital after a dramatic scene unfolds in Sugar House. U.S. Marshals shot the man as he tried to get away at 2100 South near 900 East. That's where new specialist Debbie Worthen joins us live tonight. Debbie, what do you know? Well, what we have learned tonight is that the manager here at Burt Brothers called police. Now, he said he watched the whole thing go down. He says the man was the ex-husband of one of his employees, and when he asked him to leave, he wouldn't. Moments later, U.S. Marshals rushed in. Out of nowhere, uh, five or six unmarked police cars came and chased him out of our parking lot uh, down the street. Francisco and Rodriguez has never seen enough. anything like it. They stopped him at the end of the, uh, of the road and then these smoke bombs or something went off. Those officers chased the suspect, but he didn't get far. He knocked over a telephone pole, it looked like, and then um, shots started firing. The U.S. Marshal's Office says the agency was assisting the state of Utah with the parole fugitive. When they approached him, he tried to get away and presented a threat to officers. Rodriguez believes that's when officers surrounded the man. There were a couple bombs went off and a whole bunch of smoke. You couldn't see anything, and then out of nowhere you just seen... I, I could maybe 25 officers. It's a night he'll never forget. It was pretty intense. And there was so many cars and everything. So pretty scary, actually. Well, here at Smith's, this is Lincoln Street, right along 2100 South. Uh, right along Smith's, the crime tape is still up. This is still a very active scene out here. Salt Lake City Police Department will now conduct this OICI investigation and will present their findings to the district attorney's office. I'll send it back to you. Yeah, interested to find out what those findings are. All right, Debbie, thank you. This is breaking news from KSL. Good evening. We are following breaking news uh, from Antelope Island this evening. The park evacuated and shut down because of a shooting. The Davis County Sheriff's Office telling us they now have a suspect in custody. And news specialist Lindsay Ertz is getting updates from officers over the last hour. Lindsay, what are they telling you now? Yeah, Debbie, well, we don't know a ton about what happened here, but police believe it did start or at least was called in as a road rage incident. Um, but they haven't said what led up to this shooting. But what they do say is that a man in his 50s was shot. That man is now in stable condition. And you can see the causeway behind me where police are. Uh, that is where they believe about a mile and a half down the causeway from the toll booth, this man was shot. Now, the Davis County Sheriff's Office says the suspect, again, is in custody. They say this suspect fled on foot and was able to hide in the marshy area and a Department of Public Safety helicopter was then able to locate him. Now, even though the sheriff's office isn't saying exactly what led up to this shooting, they did say that people should not engage with other drivers. Stay safe out there. Don't engage uh, with other motorists who seem to potentially have behaviors that you don't know about. The message should just be we're grateful that law enforcement was able to arrive within six minutes, gave life-saving aid to this individual, and hopefully this person will now survive. 
Now, again, the park and the causeway is going to be shut down until they can finish the investigation. Police tell that may be tomorrow or possibly the next day. Now, a few other tidbits that we do know. There were six people involved in this uh, shooting situation. There were three in the suspect's car, three in the car that was allegedly shot at. And so we know that the two people that were also in the suspect's car, police say they were cooperating with the investigation. Again, the suspect is in custody. But again, you guys here live on the scene, one man uh, in his 50s in the hospital now. We're told he's in stable condition after being shot on. On Antelope Island. For Live at 5, I'm Lindsay Ertz. I turn the ISO up on my camera and I have this dark photo of this flag waving and smoke is tear gas is coming down and there's hardly any more people up the top. It just was weirdly over. You know, I walked two blocks, called the Uber. I just remember looking at who my driver was going to be, and I was so relieved that this driver was a black man. Because I really, honestly, couldn't deal with any more white folks that day. I couldn't. I was just over it. For many people charged in connection with the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol, Donald Trump's victory has led to celebration. Throughout Trump's campaign, he called the rioters political prisoners and promised pardons on his first day in office. As NPR's Tom Dreisbach reports, January 6th defendants and their families are expecting Trump to follow through. For the last few years, on a corner outside the Washington, D.C. jail, supporters of the January 6th defendants have held a vigil for the people they call patriots. Last night, there was champagne. The FBI calls the January 6th attack an act of domestic terrorism. 140 police officers were injured by bats, stun guns, fists, and pepper spray. On this corner, it was a righteous protest against what they still believe, despite the evidence, was a stolen election. Saw what happened in 2020, we said never again, and we got our country back. Yeah. Yeah. We did it. Praise the Lord. Nicole Reffitt helps lead the vigil. Her husband, Guy, is serving a seven-year prison sentence for bringing a gun onto Capitol grounds during the riot. He threatened his kids if they turned him into the FBI, and his son actually testified for the prosecution said that his dad told him, quote, traitors get shot. Now, Nicole is hoping Trump follows through on his pardon promise. And Trump being elected isn't going to help put my family back together. But what it may do is maybe get Guy out so we can start that process. Brandon Fellows was held inside the D.C. jail for years on January 6 charges. He was convicted of nonviolent offenses for breaching the Capitol, smoking a joint in a Senate office. Now he's on supervised release on the outside of the jail, looking in. I don't know about everybody, but I know I'm getting pardoned. <laughs> Fellows told us he thinks the violence on January 6th was justified to stop Biden from taking office. I want everybody to be pardoned because uh, the election was stolen and they had a right to fully overthrow it. I wish they did. During his campaign, Trump promised the pardons would come on his first day back in office, but he hasn't given details. Here he is on CNN last year. Uh, I am inclined to uh, pardon many of them. I can't say for every single one because a couple of them probably they got out of control. But Prosecutors have brought more than 1,500 January 6 cases, ranging from simple trespassing type charges to violent assaults on police and seditious conspiracy against the United States. Trump is likely to end ongoing prosecutions, and he said he will consider pardons for people convicted of assaulting police. Lawyers for January 6th defendants, like John Pierce, are asking the courts to pause cases until after Trump's inauguration and are preparing for the pardon process. We're certainly going to seek pardons for all of our defendants, regardless of what they were charged with or convicted of. So we're going to start putting together packets of information with respect to each defendant to try to push those through as quickly as we can. Heidi Byrick is with the Global Project Against Hate and Extremism. She said that Trump's promise to undo the January 6th prosecutions could energize violent extremist groups that attack the Capitol. One of the things the prosecutions did is they decimated groups like the Oath Keepers by putting their leadership in prison, which 
I think, contributed to the lack of major protests by these groups over the last year and a half or so. Well, now all hands are going to be off. She said that a pardon from the president of the United States would send a powerful signal. Groups like the Proud Boys will feel that violence is just fine. And we might see them back out on the streets and much more aggressive and targeting people who they view as their opponents, whether those are folks on the left, people of color, and others. And for the people convicted of felonies, a pardon would give them back the right to own guns. Thomas Jocelyn is also concerned about more violence. He's a counterterrorism expert and served as a senior staff member on the January 6th Select Committee in Congress. And he told me he's worried that Trump's victory this week will whitewash not just January 6th, but all of Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election. I'm very worried that all the lies that he's told about our elections, all of the basically incitement he did, will now be sanitized by virtue of the fact that he won a second term. He told me the work of the committee was about demanding at least moral accountability for Trump's role in January 6th. He believes their investigation will stand the test of time, even if that's not reflected in how people voted. Tom Dreisbach, NPR News. Getting my champagne, I'm going to pour a teaspoon out for Ashley Babbitt. My sick white sister. This triumph is for you, Ashley Babbitt. Ashley Babbitt, not forgotten. Context of white supremacy. Also want to recognize, while I was out of Seattle, the passing of the great, he was born in Chicago, but he spent his formative years in Washington State, Seattle specifically, went to Garfield High School. I walked past Garfield High School all the time. I'm Central District, the great Quincy Jones, Michael Jackson connection, Tupac connection, did the theme song for the Negro Cultural Gym, Sanford and Son, how you have two Negroes living in a trash heap without Quincy Jones jamming all the way in, old Red Fox. The great Quincy Jones. Man. Seattle legend. Just passed away. And this week, thespian Tony Todd also passed away. He was in Night of the Living Dead. White man blamed the death of his white daughter on old Negro Tony Todd. Night of the Living Dead. Then he was in Candyman two times. I mean, he was symbolically castrated. They chopped off his arm. He's terrorizing white women and all that. Remember? Shout to Cabrini Greens in Chicago. They tore that down. Chicago two times. They tore that down. Final destination. Extraordinary talents of the great Tony Todd passed away this week at the age of 69, which is an indictment disgrace. The system of white supremacy racism. Compensatory call in context of white supremacy in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Saturday, November 9, 2024. So I have been told first post election compensatory call in to time president elect Donald Trump. Now, Man, can I invoke GW one time? Fool me once. Shame. Shame on you. Fool me. Fool me twice. You get fooled once. Can't get fooled again. It can't be in 2016 everybody except Dr. Francis Cress Welsing was gobsmacked. What? How? No. No. I don't believe it. What? I could. Who? When? Who saw? What? Okay, so that's what that was last time. Okay. And then you saw January 6th and all that and blah, blah, blah. And Biden couldn't even run and all that. It can't be 
who time president elect Donald Trump and you say the exact and you heard that you say I feel exactly like I went back to 201 sick now wait a minute wait a minute <laughs> that cannot be maybe you didn't hear Dr. Welsing you don't listen to the cows all that but I mean really you got surprised about this two times I don't want to hear nothing else about non-white because there shouldn't have been no non-white person saying I'm surprised about I couldn't believe this nah, nah, nah. we're not honest we're not informed about white supremacy racism I said man, Dr. Welsing so far ahead of her time look at that it's like she was right here with us not that she's been deceased for almost a decade and she's still more accurate than we are that's how far she was ahead of her time or how behind we are I guess relative however you want to look at it we still haven't caught up Dr. Welsing we still you give us another 50 years maybe we lagging lagging you have commentary to share the number 605 313 5164 the code 56 four nine four three pound press star six one if you would like to participate broadcasting live from San Francisco it was in Berkeley the past two days wasn't able to get the live feed on on and rolling so you can listen on the blog or tune in or you can call six oh five three one three five one six four the code five six four nine four three pound press star six one if you would like to participate I just want to document for the record because I said last week City Hall last week they had the colors for City Hall the 49ers colors the 49ers didn't even play that's the tackle football team brain damage they didn't even have a game last week they had a so-called bye week they are playing this week and they don't have those colors up this week they have red white and blue now how tacky is that that's supposed to be for election week get out of here and, and the election passed man like put up some different colors man anyway uh, here in San Francisco live feedback we're not doing the full three hours because Gus T is on location this has been a business trip capital B grown people business trip in every sense of the word I even had to pause and think I think I've had in the last six days I've had exactly one day where I was not out and up and about at the library researching doing something well in advance of 9 a.m. like up 8 7 something super duper early rolling ready to go this has not been vacay in California and we're gonna hit the club and even lounge because a lot of people just love lounge in the hotel watch some TV hit the pool or whatever that hey we <laughs> We did more than even didn't even do that. Didn't even do that. On the grind. Weeks to go. I am homesick. I cannot emphasize enough. Man. And I am homesick and I am someplace that I love. California is amazing. Not the, the non LA parts. Amazing still. But man. <laughs> cannot wait. But being constructive and on my assignment all day long that's all I did literally <clears throat> minutes before we went live all day long <clears throat> copying Jonestown material trying to take every scrap of paper that they have in the Bay Area related to Jonestown and they have a lot of material I think before I had been measuring by thousands of files I have to measure by gigabytes of information at this point excluding video content that's mostly gigabytes of written files 
gargantuan and probably that even that is not enough I will say I'm very aware Jonestown happened a long time ago a lot of us are not aware of that don't care about that it might be that reading every scrap of paper about Jonestown does not help replace white supremacy with justice that might be true but wow it has been staggering even a staggering reminder of why I wanted to come to this area the epicenter ground zero if you will metaphor of the Jonestown saga for the most part would be here Guyana certainly but that's kind of the tail end of it for the most part this is the epicenter wow is all I can say even even where I have been throughout the Bay Area to acquire information with the November 18 cemetery memorial I hope still in the waiting that's weeks away San Francisco public library main branch where they have racks of material zebra murders too racks of material going back tomorrow take days and days and days to just go through and staggering California Berkeley they have two different libraries so they have the special collections at the University of California Berkeley and then they have the graduate theology library that is also a part of the University of California Berkeley two separate special libraries with separate material in both places I was at the theology library on Friday and I didn't want to leave because of the material that I found what did I find they have interviews with black children who were in the people's temple from like 10 11 were in it for 10 years they were there the day of the murders they came back to the Bay Area and did interviews, described, you know, what happened to them. They have transcripts of that. Audio interviews with some of these people and all kinds of other written reports that didn't get published, that you wouldn't get access to. Stunning. Even I said audio cassettes because I opened up some of the folders and they had written transcripts and then they just had, bang, cassettes fell out. I went to the white librarian thus far I think all of the people at all of these different special libraries have been classified as white except for one and this was a non-white non-black person who was very pale might even have one white parent but everybody else white for sure white dudes white females oh it's two take that back it's been two individuals that I think are non-white at all of these different branches the special collections I'm talking about specifically where sometimes you have to put white gloves on to look at some of this material but I get the audio cassettes he says oh do you want copies of these give us you know a week or so and we'll have them done <laughs> take everything take everything Cal University of California's regular special collections library different branch just went there haven't even got everything I will say it is a little odd I think two of the different collections that I wanted Eldridge Cleaver Cointel Pro Black Panthers right here uh, where their Genesis they couldn't find them fascinating we have ways to go so this is just come back we'll locate them right on have other material related so excited I think they even have Eldridge Cleaver talking about the people's temple but going back we'll see if we get all the other uh, goodies the Seattle Public Library I forgot to even include I've got so much material it's even been difficult because I said before a lot of times when I'm in Seattle you find something where you get hundreds of documents you can't read it all immediately so you just you know it's copy download copy download copy blah, blah, blah. just get it all and then you can peruse at your leisure once you get back to your house in your footies feet off comfortable that's normally the way I would do it here as opposed to finding like hundreds it's like getting thousands so you really don't have time to read all this just 
copy, 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 copy. And really, you can go through all this and organize once you get back to Seattle, to be truthful. Man, I was getting duck like, because they have, like, some of the foreign papers from the Caribbean and Guyana and other parts of the world that, you know, were died, which is fascinating to see. But one that stood out there is no, I mean, they literally have that probably tens of thousands of pages related to Jonestown people's temple they were here for all of those years they were here way longer than they were in Guyana there are tens of thousands of pages there is no like central exhibit there is no like collated boom Jonestown or no Jonestown library nothing it is appalling I mean some of the stuff is just Literally just kind of thrown in the folder, you know, boom, no real care, whatever, just kind of in there. And to the point, one of many things, this is, I think, the one that thus far, this and the documents, some of the documents I saw today and the transcripts of some of the children who made it back that really like staggering to see. Um, it was an envelope. And it was nondescript. It had, and this is in the Harvey Milk folder. That's why I mean, a lot of this stuff is dispersed, you know, through a lot of other places and subjects and all that. This is in the Harvey Milk folder. Condolence letters for one of his friends who passed away. And it's just got name, or I think it says condolence letters from Jim or Jonestown. I open it up and out spills about a hundred. It could be two hundred letters no exaggeration it's at least 100 it could be 150 200 handwritten letters from September 1978 Guyana to Harvey Milk after the death of his friend I was staggered I dropped I mean I literally dropped them on the desk and stepped back it was like someone had knocked my breath out like well I felt one you should have gloves on to touch these like whoa and I said the same thing. This should be an, an exhibit. Like you could go. Some of these were children. You could tell from the handwriting. It was all squiggly and everything else. These, they could have photos. Who was this person? Who wrote this? That could be matched up so people could see and all of that. Who are their relatives? And just the significance. This is two months before all these people were killed and Harvey Milk. And like showing the relationship between Jones and Harvey Milk, which also has come through looking at all these documents. But man, I was so stunned. The librarian ran over. I was like, oh man, what'd you find? If I may, I know I'm being nosy. I know I'm a white woman. I know I'm being nosy. What'd you find? What'd you find? And I told her, she's like, oh my God. That's another thing that's been stunning too. All the different libraries that I've been to, I haven't even been to Stanford yet. And they have racks i had been saying that the whole time we were reading stanford the great dr william shockley i've been saying that the whole time they have racks of jonestown material that nobody else has at stanford and stanford is just like berkeley they have two different special libraries probably more than that but at least two different special libraries. they have dr huey p newton's manuscripts that talk about Jonestown. They got Dr. William Shockley. Crates of them. I told you about. Uh, haven't even got there yet. That's coming up this week. White people are not. Ignorant. About racism. And it, it has been. Stunning thus far. Every librarian that I've talked to. Some of them who've went and. You know individually has brought me like 12 boxes. Of material related to Jonestown. Not one of them informed about Jonestown. Not one. Some of them, they lived here. All that happened. They were here. All they could say, you know what they're going to say. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Boy, wasn't he wacky. What? I'm even looking at them like, have you looked at some of the material? that? You, uh, obviously not. <laughs> Who cares about Negras? But that has been stunning to not. There's not one Jonestown expert on the staff and 
oh yeah, I know all about this, and boom, 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 and Mayor Moscone, and boom, 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 because they were going down the joke road, and I said, wait a minute, man, there were 300 children, oh my, God. they got the foster care records, like even before they got the Jones, they got records about them trying to open a school for, oh my, God. it just goes on, the children, the children, like, don't be snickering about no Kool-Aid. 300 children almost died and were killed in this. They didn't drink no Kool-Aid. They were ki- I've had to back down two or three librarians about that. Like, man, this is not nothing to snicker about. A thousand people, period. 300 children. And they were like, whoa, whoa. And some of them, oh, yeah, that's right. That's what I said. They didn't even identify nearly 200 of them. They just dumped them in a hole in Oakland. Oh, yeah, that's right. And they, then they said, it was a dark time. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. That notwithstanding, I will say a part of why I'm homesick to get all of this data, you have to sit in really st- Sterile environments. And what I mean is, this is not just the library, which wouldn't be quite as bad, but this is the special collections where norm- you have to check in your coat, you have to check in your backpack, you can't have any food, you can't have any water, nothing to drink, you have to put on gloves sometimes to look at the material. They have lots of rules. Obviously, you can't have a cell phone, which would kill some people. Uh, it's just, it is a really sterile environment. You can't have any pens. I uh, so many rules. You're under surveillance <laughs> the whole time, uh, and to just sit there and you're just for hours, just copying records, copying records, copying records. Any hoodles? Uh, it has been st- not even being able to read everything, just kind of glancing at things quickly as they go by. It has been staggering. Uh, Just and the volume of material that white people collect about all types of things, mostly racism. I think even a white man came in today trying to examine racism. Everything leads back to racism. But wow, white people collect a staggering amount of information about everything. Oh my God, how much information? Why did I come? Even because of the book we read, it's Jonestown, a CIA medical experiment. He had all that talk about voter fraud. They have got a chunky, and when I say chunky, like, what I say, tens of thousands, it looks like it's probably about 200 pages just on the report on voter fraud with Moscone in 75 I don't think Jim Jones name is in that folder but ooh wee that is Jim Jones right there and it's oh, it's so detailed and for me to get that this week they were talking about it was so lame and easy for people to cheat and vo- oh my god man the amount of information that white people have is staggering where they can just pile 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 Man, Jim Flippin' Jones. Oh, and they even had the Pied Piper. I've been playing Ara Kelly, the Pied Piper. They literally have articles in there. Jim Jones, the Pied Piper. Uh, any hoodles. More on that. Everybody, I hope everybody gets to it. One, that's why reading, more important than watching television, everybody should find something to research Go to your local library, because that's what I I went to the local library. Go to your local community college. Go to your local, if you have a college, university, go to it. Make sure you go to special collections. There has got to be something racism, counter-racism related that you want every document they have. It's got to be something. Even that will help you be more codified, because, wow, it is a... It is a process and a lot of information and detail and codification, even finding these documents and then going to acquire them because you have to fill out a lot of paperwork that has to be very precise and all the rest of it. So hopefully everybody will be inspired, something that is not, or maybe it will be TV that will inspire you, but to 
do some serious research that is beyond just watching television. Inspiration right there, Gus T. Live in San Francisco, looking forward to going to Stanford, the Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Don't you go to Stanford and not get those William Shockley. I was lit, man. I was because they got so much on Dr. Shockley at Stanford. I was a looking to see if they got anything about his debate with Dr. Welsing. I haven't seen that yet, but I might not have looked correctly. I will report back after I get back from Palo Alto. Any hoodles, uh, we're not doing the full three hours, so hand up star six one if you have commentary to share. Uh, I'll get to the phone lines. Don't wait around to like go ahead and get your hand up right now. I just want to say about the news clips really quickly. Uh, we did turn the clocks back this week. All of that reminded me of Neely Fuller Jr. and one of his really great illustrations or suggestions with regards to counter racism codification use of time and energy. He talks about correct sleep. Now, they were talking about doing all that extra sleeping. I do want to add my own personal commentary. It is not possible to catch up on sleep. You heard some of the people talking about that. You get this extra hour. You can sleep more. So if you don't rest enough during the week, you cannot catch up on rest. And white people have studies about this. If you are sleep deprived, uh, it's not something where, oh, I, I, I slept three hours Monday night and Tuesday night. So I'll sleep 12 hours to compensate on Saturday your body and rest does not work that way there is uh, your body will compensate for that lack of rest and that's not something you make up for what you do is get correct what he's Mr. Fuller said correct sleeping not sleeping an hour and not sleeping 15 hours correct sleeping now for some people that might be six hours great for some people that might be nine hours other reports I've seen we all probably need to add one hour to what we normally the amount of rest we get anyway myself included so if you normally do seven probably get that up to eight if you normally do eight you probably get that up to nine we all really sleep deprived especially victims of racism but correct use of time and energy do some cleaning exchanging views on racism or minimize contact if you're just going to name call and squabble about the election. Uh, let's see. They had the report uh, on. <laughs> they had the report about the black children, younger people, students being threatened with text messages about picking cotton. And we heard from one of the parents who said uh, that uh, no one should be threatened. I don't care if they're black, brown, polka dot, blue. <laughs> one of my favorite metaphors. The problem is skin color. And again, if it was a polka dot or purple or whatever, you know, bizarre color that they pick, it would matter. I don't see polka dot people and I'm not going to pretend like, oh, it's a polka dot person. I don't get like, whoa, is this contagious? Is this COVID-25? Like, what's going on here? Where did you come from? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Put that border up, man. What's, 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 no, I don't want the polka dots, man. Purple, same thing. It's white supremacy racism. We heard that other cliche that it is 2024 and they talking about picking cotton. They said slave cat now. Whoa. Yeah, you can't tell me that you classified as white and you ignorant about racism and you threatening non-white children in a personal way as though you know these people. And talking about slave catchers and all the rest. You sound like you have done some studying Maybe you've been to special collections to do some research on white supremacy, racism, too. You even sound plantational like Jim Jones. Got them down in Guyana picking the cassava and the fruits and such. They didn't do cotton, but, you know, plantation all the same. Any hoodles. Uh, they also, they used my favorite term in talking about all this with the election. White people. Right wingers, extremists will now be energized, emboldened. They have the word list. We're almost at the end of 2024. They have words that should not be used, but we should let that go. It's tired. It's overused. <laughs> emboldened. Hey, man, we have had January 6th at this point. We've had Trump two times around. 
how much more emboldened are they going to be? How much more energy? We got Trump. He got elected. You rioted at the Capitol. How much more emboldened are white people going to be? Nah, man. Let that one go. We can come up with a new word. So white people have become radicalized. In stage white supremacy raising we don't need to add no more no more the emboldened come on uh, with the all of the election results I was so glad and they had the one segment and she said I want to start first and foremost with my sick white sisters thank you start right there you can start right there he got over 50 percent of the white women voters again third that's why I said that you fooled me first time but eh, I kind of already seen it particularly it was a white woman running against Trump the first time and the white sister still said eh, I like that Trump you're fired OBZ get him on don't you want Clinton she's too close to that she's nigga lover too get on you're fired get out of here they didn't even roll with their white sister the first time right? why do you think they're going to roll with come on heck not I don't want to blame matter of fact old old beasy come on out here black brother you gonna sit here and wag your finger about the black male let me hear you make a mumbling word about these no count raggedy white women heifers man y'all can't even what get you gonna go with this he talking about the females and a felon at that come on old beasy not gone You come out and blame Leroy again. I'll wait for that one. Tell us it was our fault. Jamal. Call us sexist and toxic. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. The folks being wrong. We did the election night coverage live here in San Francisco. And uh, the folks talking about they were <laughs> whatever way that they felt about all of this. Again, you should not be surprised. No cause to argue with other non-white people victims of white supremacy racism. If anything, I would point out like, wow, Bitcoin hit a record high after two-time president-elect Donald Trump's victory. Wow. (laughs) What? Wow. What? economics of white supremacy racism they said all these economic gains and what tied to trump winning the dollar is crushing the euro what that would be something i would share like as opposed to we can sit around and blame black people and why didn't you vote and whatever else wow did you see what what you think that means what is that communicating to us about white people and the economics of white supremacy racism Any hoodles, uh, the black, or excuse me, the white terrorist who attempted to bomb the power grid in Nashville, Tennessee, 24 years old, said he wanted to cause all the white supremacists, terrorists. It reminded me, they had been talking about this earlier in the week, but I didn't think of it, remember it till today. Do y'all remember at the end of 2020, it was almost Christmas Day, a white man set off an explosive device in an RV and it knocked out the telephone system in Nashville. Do you all remember that? At the time they didn't have a motive. They said that there was some sort of audio alert that went off prior to the detonation, uh, whether it was warning people or something and then it detonated. I think the perpetrator was in the RV, but it knocked out. It was right next to a telephone <clears throat> communication system in Nashville, and it knocked out. I think about 10,000 phones, maybe even more than that. It called, and this was at the holidays, like I said. It was right almost Christmas of 2020, which was in the middle of the Rona, I may add, before they even had a vaccine, and in the midst of right before January 6 as well. And they're like, oh, what did he do? What is this? I hadn't even thought because I really hadn't processed all of that because it happened before January. But that's, that's what, 16 days, 17 days before January 6th? And he set off that explosive device in Nashville. And then you get Skylar Philippi comes 24-year-old, what, 24? 
in that interview. I thought the oh, Peasy, you lying, no count. He told you, he said, the young white people are doing better, see, you know. They, they okay, they like years better. I look at Sasha and Malia and you shut up. Don't tell me nothing else. I don't want to hear no, shut up, shut up, just shut up. VGQ, but I mean, wow, you do not give out constructive, accurate information, OBZ. Just come out the lambast, black dudes, get out of here. Let's see, I remember Brothers Keeper. I remember, you know, yeah. Beat it, OBZ. Victims guaranteed qualified. Uh, the Nashville fella coordinated all of that, and they said they earned his trust. Got in, he got all these plans where he planned to do. That's another one I'd be sharing, like, oh man. Do we have a backup generator and all that? I guess because Hurricane Milton and all the rest of it, it might be good. But Jesus Christ, he even referenced North Carolina. We talked about that a little bit later. That was at the end of 2022. Trying to buy. And that was at Christmas, too, if my memory. Oh, my God. Was Am I wrong? Y'all can go back and let me know. But I think that was Christmas time, too, December of 2022. So that's two years after the bombing in Nashville, December 2020. We're going to go get the power. Because shooting at the power grid. See, we knocked out. And that's all in the Turner Diaries. That's all in the Turner Diaries. That's all in the Turner Diaries. That's what I'd be talking about. You can talk about what you're going to do with your extra hour. I'm not arguing with my family about nothing. If we live in the Tennessee area, did you see this? Do you have backup generator, power, anything? We live in North Carolina. Did you see this? And it's a whole lot of territories where they were doing the attacks on the power grid. Here in Washington State, I got a tempted family that, yeah, the Trump thing. That's happening. Did you see this? And I guess, did your, if you have young did your daughter, son, my niece, nephew, potentially, did they get some sort of tacky text message about picking cotton and slay cut? That would be another one to ask, as opposed to, why didn't you vote? You voted for Kamala Harris and all that. You got a backup generator in case the power goes out? Race soldiers attack the power grid again? You know who Skylar Filippi? You know who that is? Just saying. Uh, anything else? Uh, and I'll check, see if folks have uh, commentary to share. The January, s- <laughs> all of the correspondence that has been written on January 6th and what people have said, they've been prosecuted and all the rest of it, all that needs to be thrown in the trash. I cannot imagine. Like I said, hey, they said they are immediately, they're going to ask that all of the trials and court proceedings be paused, and they're going to request a pardon. Enrique Toro, my mulatto brother, my biracial brother, is he going to get a pardon? I asked that on election night. Is he going to get a pardon? You put him all in my face, and it wasn't just white people. It wasn't just white people. Enrique Torres was there. He was leading the charge, in fact, you see. Okay. Enrique going to get a pardon? Because they hit him almost 30 years, you know be 2060 by the time he get out of there they make you pretty much do the whole thing if you get fair time so is Enrique going to get a part on day one I don't mean no fiddling around and he got to wait till the end of your turn we got to come you know 2028 and then you said day one is Enrique going to get a pardon on day one and then we'll get to all the rest of these white people like pardon on day one January two are like days away we out of here Champagne ready. Wow. What does it? That's why I said, ain't no more emboldened. I don't even want to hear that nonsense because a whole lot of those white people that did all that, they didn't get arrested anyway. So, you know, got Enrique, but whatever. But especially now, (laughs) he gets elected. And like I said, I don't even view that. That white person at the end, he said that these were lies. They now feel they're going to white wash that word should be in the word guy they're going to whitewash all of this and accept trump's lies i told you i look at 2020 a little different now because like i thought then maybe they did cheat now i he couldn't biden quit on his stool he couldn't even take his defeat like a man he had to quit on his stool and put kamala harris that come on yes i too think maybe they did cheat in 2020 maybe donald trump should have been two times back then. But whatever. Here we is. 
two-time president-elect Donald Trump, as predicted by Dr. Francis, Dr. Francis Cress Wells, and was not what? I can't believe it. No, counter-racist scientist. I told you, end-stage white supremacy. Pointing this out as fascism a decade ago. Catch up, man. White genetic annihilation. That's why ain't nobody talking about abortion. We keeping all the white babies. Ain't nobody worried about no abortion. Get out of here. White genetic annihilation. Star 61. The number 605. 313-5164 313-5164 the code 564-943 pound press star 61 if you would like to participate uh, let's see if folks let us know how the if you've been arguing with family minimizing all the gripes and squabbles with non-white people let us know other information not related to the election you can share as well let us see uh, Lauren with us if you have commentary to share proceed evening everyone um, I on, on Tuesday night I I woke up I, I really didn't think the election would be called on Tuesday night and um, so I you know, checked the Associated Press and saw that they were uh, predicting that Trump would be the winner. Um, where I reside, the the white people in this area, they were exploding fireworks. Um, this went on for like an hour or two. And also um, on the freeway overpass, this is the next day I saw this, on the freeway overpass, um, someone had written... Uh, make America grateful again. It was in all caps, but the T in grateful was a lowercase T, like the Christian cross. Made me think about the white evangelicals. Um, uh, I guess racist white supremacists. Um, I saw an article in the New York Times said uh, Mayor Chokwe Lumumba was indicted on conspiracy and bribery charges. So he's the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, another black male mayor there. Also, there was an interesting, like this was today, there was an article in the New York Times in um, the headline title, Two Militia Founders Are Convicted of Plot to Kill Federal Agents. Um, it was written by Adil Hassan. But um, so these two, what I think is white men, they did not put a picture of the white men on the article. They put a picture of non-white people at the border. But they plotted a trip to the U.S.-Mexico border to shoot at immigrants and the authorities who might try to stop them. They said they were going out hunting. They made a TikTok video saying that U.S. border control was committing treason by allowing illegal immigrants to enter the U.S. and that the penalty for treason was death. Um, so the agents, they were supposed to, like, go to the border. Like, oh, this happened in 2022. Um, and they were supposed to go to the border, like, on October 8th. So October 7th, the law enforcement officials get to their house, Right. And they, it's like FBI agents. And they, they come to the house in an armored vehicle and identify themselves through a loudspeaker. It said the agents were met with gunfire and several rounds hit the vehicle. The agents did not return fire. Um, so one, one white man, Mr. Odell, he surrendered. And the other white man, Mr. Perry, was arrested at the home, but only after he brawled with agents and injured one, according to court documents. The agents found six guns, 23 magazines filled with ammunition, 1,800 rounds of other ammunition, two sets of body armor, two gas masks, two ballistic helmets, and zip ties, and they also discovered multiple containers of liquids that would explode upon mixing. 
Yeah, that's all I have. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Wow. Much obliged for sharing. Lauren, uh, thank, who's in a state that Kamala Harris actually did win, where she said they were letting off battle simulations, a.k.a. fireworks, for <laughs> two-time president-elect Donald Trump. Wacky. <laughs> See there? Remnants, L.A. air, even though I'm breathing so much better since I've been away from L.A. Woof. Anywho, all of that body armor, I think some of that you're supposed to, you know, you need white permission to even possess some of those items unless I have been misinformed. She said some of them brawled with enforcement officers. Aren't you supposed to be shot? She said they'd already fired shots and then brawled. You're supposed to be shot then, right? That's, let me get my nigra knocker and go to town. At least give out some brain damage. Come on. Come on. They got, they got all the, the, the liquids that explode. I don't even know what that is. Is that in Anarchist Cookbook? I don't even, come on. Research a little bit about everything. Poor man's James Bond. Another one read that. Reb and Dill, they probably know what that is. Like, oh yeah, you mix that, boom, boom, you can go to Home Depot and cock that up. Blow up the whole town. Mm. What does it mean to be white? I can tell you all that. It reminded me the violent take it by force. They got the audio book down here in San Francisco. They have the physical book on order. There are already 18 hold requests on the one copy of the violent Take It By Force book that was just published this year. We played an audio segment talking about it before, even related to the white evangelicals and such, talking about they mad about COVID-19 and changed up the Sunday worship patterns and all that. And that was a part of this. That's another group. I didn't hear Obeezy. Come on, white evangelicals corrupting the good Lord's word. Hey, come on, it's easy to get out here and talk about Leroy and black people are laying, black dudes are laying. That's easy. You get out here and give these white evangelicals some lip service. Quote from the violent, take it by force. You got some chutzpah, obesity. Victims guaranteed qualified. Victims. Guaranteed quality. I don't want to really want to hear from Obama no more. They pulled him out for the election and all that nonsense. Like, shh, shh. let's see. Other folks, if you have commentary to share, again, not waiting till the last moment. Lots to do here in San Francisco. Our caller at the courthouse in Florida, Ron DeSantis. He was so happy they didn't pass uh, the cannabis legislation down in Florida, and he was ah. And Trump won. I don't know how he feels about Trump. But, eh, called me all those names. I don't like that Trump. <laughs> I don't know. But either way, he was really happy about the cannabis rec. No recreational cannabis in the Sunshine State. Uh, caller at the courthouse. Did you have commentary, sir? Yes, sir. May I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Greetings to Gus, the host, the listeners and callers. Um, Gus, that reminds me, uh, when, when I think it was like a week ago, they were having this event called the Fest, and it was white people everywhere. Um, and I, as I was walking after work, um, I'm passing by all of these white people, and it's the, the smell of marijuana. And, um, uh, they, I guess, were starting this weekend about this, the Fest concert. So this is leading up to, uh, where they were going to vote on these amendments. Um, and then some of the ads as well even mentioned, like, the, uh, the KKK and, uh, I forgot who, 
this white man name was, but it, it was it was rarely it was a rarely shown political ad. Um, but it mentioned the abortion quite often. Uh, and I, I was thinking about the the audio segment where I think someone asked a white woman, "Did uh, did Kamala Harris address anything for you? Or did you not want to vote for her?" And she just said, "Yeah, it's just something. It was just things that she just didn't address for me." Or um, you know, I was thinking about the economy. I just think she was practicing racism. And she just wanted to just vote, you know, of course, for, um, you know, President-elect uh, Donald Trump. You know, and she's saying, yeah, you know, she wasn't talking about the, the border and the the criminals coming over. And I thought, <laughs> I thought, oh, oh, my goodness, you know, and how some of those uh, reports were mentioning suburban women. Uh, suburban, and I, I just thought about that. That that played in my head. Um, and one last thing was that it was the the segment about the the racist text messages, and it was toward the end. I think that was a white person that was doing the narration. Um, said, "Well, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with the the people receiving it." It just has something to do with the people sending it. Uh, something uh, I thought that was interesting that he had said. Um, but other than that, uh, there has been some people, uh, especially like where I work at, you know, they're coming in there with those flags and stuff and Trump T-shirts. But I can I can see that some of the coworkers. They, for the most part, hadn't gotten upset, but um, but the the public in general, you know, are showing that. I guess I'm thinking of that word in bold, <laughs> in bolding, but it just I just think that they're more, uh, I guess, comfortable, uh, confident, I guess, but they, I think, have been showing that already. Um, in the area where I am. And other than that, that's all I have to share right now. Thanks for allowing me to speak. Much obliged. He said the aroma of reefer in the air. Not even legal. Man. Man. Uh, <laughs> I, I was thinking the same thing that the folks at the courthouse the warden, the new warden, chaos coordinator and all that, they've been emboldened for decades, man. They cut a fool and hit the panic button and break all the rules. You don't tell me how to dress and all the rest of it and manipulate the uh, PTO policy and all the rest of it. Like, they've been emboldened forever. Uh, social media, <laughs> go, go do the wedding photos with the guns. They've been emboldened for a long time. This is the state of the cracker. So, yeah, they uh, probably muted somewhat in, in all of the hoopla. Just go about business as usual in, uh, in the good state of Florida. Uh, much obliged our caller <clears throat> at the courthouse um, that called about the, uh, or the report about the text messages again accurate understanding of white supremacy racism and it was it was a white person doing the interview at the end of that segment he was talking to one of the parents and he said well uh, I just I just want to get it on the record that the problem is with the person who sent the text message not the person who got the text Hmm. all right thank you I mean I guess if that may you just said hey this is what we expect from racists and with all the technology it also it is suspicious that we've not been able to track down prosecute these people hold them accountable at least identify you know who these folks are we'll follow up and see if we can make that happen 
right here on News you know, 5. But yeah, he had to get that in. Mm. Uh, other folks, if you have thoughts, the election, what happened in your area, local measures, all of that uh, non-election related material, the number again, 605 313 six four the code five six four nine four three pound press star six one if you would like to participate not waiting until you know the last minute because we're not doing the full three hours still doing our research in san francisco bay area at large so Lots more to do. Even tomorrow, getting up on the ground tomorrow will be one of the few days I get to sleep in a little bit because the library doesn't open until late. And then on Monday, got the stupid holiday. Like, that's one thing I wish. Have to mess up a whole day where I can't go to the library. But that does give me one day to do non-research things so I can go look where the People's Temple is. I can say one other thing. Uh, the People's Temple being on Geary Boulevard, I did not realize until I got here Geary Boulevard is such a strategic location for the city of San Francisco, which is not that big. You literally can take Geary Boulevard from one end of the city to the other. One of the, it would be one of the main arteries in San Francisco, like not quite as significant as like Mission and Market and Barcadero, but I mean, you could go from one end of the city to the other, Main Street, and to have the People's Temple sitting right kind of smack in the middle of the city like and in the middle of what used to be the negro part of town man and right in the middle of where the so-called zebra murders occurred man he could not have been more strategically located if you placed him anyway for the people's temple any hoodles um other information folks have to share suggestions if you have any parents uh, you can either share now or write in how you've had to talk about all of this with your offspring that would be grand because they might be having things happen at school same way that we you know are experiencing things on the job or what have you or maybe they got text messages or what have you that would be grand uh, I think you know try to make it as hopefully that's why I say it's it's not we are not being emotional, attempted parents, and older non-white people, if we are behaving like, oh, okay, even if, you know, I'm disgruntled about this for whatever reason, eh, we're still, a, even if Kamala Harris had won, we're still in a system of white supremacy racism. And that's the most important, really, that's the most important thing I would want my offspring to know. We're still in a system of white supremacy racism. And that would have been the case regardless that's what we have to try to correct not woe is me this guy won or even you know whoopee she won or whoever you know that is not the goal the goal is replace white supremacy with justice immediately and understanding that regardless of the election result that does not really move us any closer to solving that problem we just have to get back to work very important. I think that's the moment that keeps you us from being victims, all emotional and wound up and squabbling with other black people and really time and energy. That's what I'm going to do with my extra hour. Argue and, and gripe with Uncle Larry because he didn't vote or argue and gripe with Uncle Larry because he's mad that I didn't vote or something to that effect. Come on. Get Uncle Larry some Brussels sprouts so we can eat well, rest. Maybe we clean out that gutter. Cleaning, repairing, see? And then we minimize conflict for the rest of it. Last check for the number, 605-313-5164. The code, 5564943 five, pound Press star 61. If you would like to participate, Lost my Wi-Fi cook hookup, so for sure we will get ready to wrap things up. I'll give one uh, quick last check, see if anybody has any other thoughts or observations to share. We will not have the book club this coming Thursday because 
still on location, and one of the things that I had planned to do weeks before I even left Washington State was to see the black female artist Carl Walker. Uh, if you don't know who that is, you can easily search her online. Uh, they have tons of newspaper articles and pictures of her works. Uh, you can check out the one that she did, uh, art, the sculpture. I believe it's made of sugar. And it's of a black female slave victim of rape, white supremacy. Uh, but she has that and a number of other uh, sculptures and works that I think are all about white supremacy racism. She has an exhibit at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art right now. It's free. You can go. I think it's going to be here until sometime next year. I already went to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. I was there earlier this week. It was amazing. I spent the whole day there. And I didn't even get to see Howard Walker's exhibit. And I was just grumbled about it. But they said, hey, we had to dismantle it. We're putting it back together. It should be straight by Thursday. Just come back then. It's free. doesn't even matter. Just come back and you can see the whole thing. Uh, and I wanted to see it before Carl Walker is here on Thursday to discuss the exhibit. So I'll be, you know, knowledgeable and I'll already have some thoughts about it and then I can learn even more and maybe ask a question. But I'm very excited to uh, hear Ms. Walker on Thursday. So that's what I'll be doing. It's at the same time as the book club. So nothing could be done. And that is something to miss out on a book club to be able to see Carl Walker after you see her in person after all these years. Um, I think next Saturday, I'm not sure, compensatory call and have to see uh, if I'm able to uh, hang in, participate, or if I'm getting research, neutralizing workplace racism. I feel pretty confident we'll be able to do that on Friday, normal time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, but just check and see, like I said, everything is kind of a day-by-day -day basis, uh, able, hoping to accomplish as much as possible, being constructive while here in uh, California and the Bay Area, Stanford, Looming this week, Palo Alto, Dr. William Shockley. Anywho, let's see. Uh, let's see if other folks have any commentary, observations to share. Folks, you might be satisfied. I'm checking the switchboard. As I said, I did not retain my Wi Fi connection. So if the switchboard is out, then, you know, oh well. That'll just be what folks get for waiting until uh, the last minute. Or if they didn't have any commentary, they can jot them down, send us an email, especially if you have commentary on how you spoke with your uh, offspring about white supremacy racism. Man, write it down. Let us know. That would definitely be uh, appreciated for attempted parents uh, who are trying to explain all this uh, to their attempted offspring or to their offspring in a logical manner, help them not be emotional about all of this, uh, hopefully help inspire them to get this here problem solved. Oh, look at me. I got the switchboard back. Here we go. Uh, our caller, 3388-3388. Did you have commentary? Yes, sir. Can I be heard? Oh, yes, sir. We can hear you. Okay. Hey, uh, Alabama Railroad, I guess. Uh, hadn't had a chance to call in live in a while. And uh, tuned in a little late, so sorry for uh, chiming in a little late. But uh, my one, my comment is about parenting my daughter. She's a 10th grader, um, and I'm kind of always talking to her about white supremacy and kind of trying to be on the lookout for it. I know I, I, I always remind her it's not a whole lot we can do, but we can be vigil, vigil, be mindful, and just be aware. Um, one of the main problems and one of the main things I teach her and talk to her about is minimizing conflict with other black people, um, especially during this election. We had a lot of people talking about, well, you know, I had some of the divine nine voting, a lot of black people going that way, and I, I just had to kind of let her know that there's over 100, it's, I mean, it's 333 million people in the United States, 199 million of them are white. It's only about 33 million black. No matter what we do, we are not to blame. So we need to go about not trying to blame other black people. Let's not do that. I don't care what we're doing. We're not going to blame each other. I don't care who you voted for. But uh, I do want to thank you for motivating me, man. I'm six months sober. I'm walking now. So I'm just trying to do a little different so I can be here. Thank you. That's all I got. 
Wow, got my Wi-Fi back. I got my headset back. Wow, that is that's something great to hear. Like, man, motivate someone to do a little. That's the use of time and energy, right? Mr. Fuller talked about that. Eating correctly, taking care of ourselves, so that we can be healthy to replace white supremacy with justice. That's important because hey, if you don't have vitality, that's not universal man, universal woman. Now, at least that's not <clears throat> what I think of. You're supposed to be strong in mind body get things done in the universe not struggling barely making it or eating incorrectly sleeping incorrectly like that's not universal man universal woman that is not justice so bravo for that keep that up <clears throat> any form of exercise walking running yoga swimming hiking anything you can think of to get a little motion burn some calories um in terms of minimizing conflict hey that now sometimes he got just to the numbers in terms of the the population of individuals classified as white in this part of the world and then the population of people who are classified as black now sometimes <clears throat> non-white people we are receptive to that sort of logic sometimes we are not because that's just raw numbers. Either that's true or it's not. Now, if they say, I think it's 100,000 black people, or excuse me, 100 million black people here, where's the evidence? But again, some non white people, because of how we have been conditioned as victims, we don't really process and respond to logic. So you have to kind of ascertain oh, the data, what I said about the population, that doesn't mean anything. They still just want to blame, blame black people. And especially when we get excited riled up to blame black people about something Ooh, we <clears throat> I don't care about no facts truth none of that it is Negroes to be blamed I'm fitting to tell you about this coon that's when you minimize contact minimize conflict and I'm not going to listen to you you know do a whole lot of blaming black people and I, like I said now if you want to get to these white women woo I'm going to be right there to amen and ride every way with you but it is just you know that's what I told you about Leroy okay alright well I won't talk at you you get those Brussels sprouts okay and you got that generator because I told you, you got the, that, ain't, that ain't one you can put on us you can you know blame us for the election I guess wink wink but they didn't say nothing about Leroy and Jamal attacking the electric grid white people so you got your backup generator and everything okay well I talk to you later you get your rest have a blessed day minimize kind that's it that I said I've said that for years right especially at election time like oh my god the anti-blackness just it explodes exponentially they get emboldened with the anti-blackness around election time Remember in California where I'm 2008, they blame black people <clears throat> about so-called gay rights? Oh, they love it. If you are a little bit less confused about what white supremacy racism is, how it works, the science of attempted counter-racism, you demonstrate that by minimizing conflict with other non-white people. You are not seeking out non-white people for disagreements to point out where you and I have a difference of opinion, a different view, which is supposed to be allowed. Victims guaranteed qualified. You are not the person assigned to correct me. I am not the person assigned to correct you and let you know where you are making violations of counter racism code. That's not my job. And again, VGQ seeking out non-white people only if it's going to be something constructive. And that they've requested. It can't be, I say this is constructive, in quote, so we got to, uh uh uh, uh uh uh. Minimizing conflict. Once I see the conflict, okay, peace, because we do so much of that, apparently, especially at election time. Out on that, that obese leading the way. I'm going to tell you about old Leroy lazy won't even you got to be a lazy no count nigra to not go out and vote for your black sister what I know, as a matter of fact why don't you say something about these text messages obese they might have sent text messages to sasha 
and Malia, did you check and ask them, since the white people are behaving themselves and doing better, did you ask them, did y'all get any strange text messages about a slave catcher? Did you, you say anything about that? I'm just checking. I told people that they were doing better, and maybe, maybe I was wrong. Yes, you were wrong. Anywho, look at that, look at that, look at that. City Hall, red, white, and blue. Dr. Welsing talked about that, and Dr. Cambon, that the colors of white supremacy racism. It's a reason that's the color for the UK flag, a reason that's the color for the Australia flag, a reason that's the color for the French flag. You can go on and on and on. The colors of white supremacy, really, the colors of white genetic annihilation any hoodles we get everybody anybody else commentary they want to get in before we get ready to wrap up we will assume everybody is Good, at least for now. Maybe we didn't hear from folks who got into like fisticuffs and brawls with attempted family members uh, over the election. Hopefully, that is all done. The voting is over. Concession speeches have been made. That was pretty tacky and trifling too. That whole, just the whole racial theater of all this was so tacky. That's why I just, you know, if you're a non-white person, I think the more informed you are, you are really not emotional about all of this. You make your prediction about what you think is going to happen there. And then really you just make your plan about what you're going to do. Regardless, this is not something to be all whoopee and celebration and champagne. Why? We're still on the plantation. It doesn't even make sense. And that's most of the things that we do, ways that we respond, even you heard that tonight. It is 2024, and they're talking about slave catch. Yes. And in the year 3024, that's what racists will be talking about. And nigger jokes. And nigger jokes. And nigger jokes. Any hoodles, uh, Again, so no book club on Thursday. Man, they got a file on Andre Bloom at Stanford. Maybe I'll be able to nab that by the time we get back on for the book club. That's what I mean. Like White people are not ignorant about white supremacy racism. Why do you even think they would have? Who do you think is even reading a document like that at Stanford? We have Stanford alumnus or Stanford alumni uh, in our cows listening audience. Any of you all, have you read Andre Bloom's file, Stanford's special collections archive? Did you read William Shockley's special collections archives in Palo Alto? on the Negro, eugenics, population control. I'm going to see if I can get through that this week. I got lots. I, I requested and Man, you talk about code. They only let you take five boxes of files per visit. I think I requested like 23 boxes. Say, look here. Look, look, look. Five limit on the boxes per visit, man. Just had to put in more visits. That's why I had to stay down here a while. I just put in more visits. And do you know the wacky thing? I said there are two different libraries of special collections at Stanford. One is the Hoover Special Collections. The other is Stanford Special Collections. It's a four-minute walk between these two special collections libraries. Carpe diem sees the day. Can do both in the same day, hopefully, and just tick, 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 tick. 
But that right there, fully talked about that. White people, they just stockpile. It. I would love to know. But now, because most of this happened on the West Coast, you don't have as many. But I would love to know, like, are there HBCUs that have, like, Jonestown People's Temple archives? Like, they collected as much as they could from different newspapers and books and publications, had students who published, you know, dissertations and what have you about all of this if they do man i would love to go or see their catalog or what have you but i think white people it is amazing the material fuller set they can just stockpile it and save it to come back and refer to this when we need it It has been an experience. More to come. But some one of our listeners said, Brother Gus, did you get, you find the zebra identification card? I have not. I'm going to have to get grimy about that. If I have to go, I don't know. The city Hall is right there. I don't know if I go to City Hall or District Attorney if I call someone. But man, I need to at least ask three like qualified white people. Maybe the Stanford Law library or the UC Berkeley law library because this case generated a lot of court cases um yeah like what uh do you know where would be a good place to get a where they might have one of these zebra identification cards on file because I would love to see what the picture boop <laughs> right there, like what what does it have a zebra on it? I said that then. Is there a zebra on the zebra identification card? Come on, man. Everybody should find a research project about something. It's so many things to study all over the world, especially your local area, because then they'll have even more. It'll motivate you to go to the local library. You can make it a family counter racist research project. More to come. Much obliged for the folks tuning in. Hopefully, Worthy of your Saturday evening. Share that report about Nashville again. Do you all remember that? We got people that lift, uh, listen, connected to the Tennessee area. 2020 bombing, Christmas time. He said that bomb, IED in the RV, disrupted the phones and what have you. We talked about it. And then Skylar Shipley, do the same thing. Almost December is a couple weeks away. Turner Diaries, man. The order of that movie is coming. Anyway, we will be back uh, not Thursday, but Friday, maybe. I think Friday is the most definite. Friday, neutralizing workplace racism. We should be here for sure. And then Sunday, or excuse me, Saturday, compensatory call in. We'll see. Invest if you think the cows is constructive. Racism hyphen notes dot blogspot dot com racism hyphen notes dot blogspot dot com paypal button in the top right corner you'll see the links for paypal cash app venmo and the amazon wish list under gus t renegade enormous thanks to all of our investors who made this trip even possible hopefully worthy of everyone's time and energy yours mine white librarians uh, learning all this about uh, Jim Jones, Jonestown, although I did see that in the L.A. Sentinel. It said explicitly, as did Dr. Welsing, black people should study Jonestown. I am on my job. Sobriety would be best. That Ron DeSantis said, hey, we're doing our part. No wacky tobacco in Florida. We're not. They say they have said that. They say, we don't want no president, been some lamey prosecutor in some old leftist wacky town, San Francisco. You know, you come out here and be president. Like, dang. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you think about San Francisco? Dang, I thought Harvey Milk and dang, they did the same thing as California. Like, man, I thought Hollywood. And I'm like, man, I don't live here. Anyway, uh, sobriety would be best. Creator, we ask that you help us 
remain patient with other black people regardless of whom they voted for or if they were negligent in their electoral duties. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. Replace white supremacy with justice immediately. I have to see. Do they have a file on Dr. Francis Cress Welsing at Stanford? Whew. Can't wait. Can't wait. Cow signing out. Thanks all for tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, Your brother. Problem. You're a victim. Man, I'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my condition. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. <laughs>